make sure it's going. And good. So, um, welcome. My name is Jill Maraca. I'm the director of a group here at Princeton called the Web Development Services Group. Um, we like to um, tell folks, our, well, our acronym is WDS, we do sites. So basically, we're tasked with making websites for the university. Um, so um, I put this presentation together because we do a lot of Drupal sites, and sometimes we'll, um, we'll get sites that we did not build. And um, I thought I would put together a helpful um, presentation on what things you, you need to, to think about. So, so think of it like this. So imagine you're sitting at home and your doorbell rings and on your doorstep is this. And you think, all right, well, I have a cat. You know, I think I can take care of this. This isn't going to be so bad. I, I've seen one of these before. But then you realize, um, oh, I don't know, this isn't so cute. No, I'm not really sure what to do with this. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what this presentation is about. Like, where to start when something like this is on your doorstep? You think you've seen a cat, you kind of know, but you're not, you're, you've never really had this, this kind of cat. Um, and you're now the, the person responsible for this. Um, and this session is, it's, um, it's about Drupal, but it could be applied to any website that you suddenly inherit or become in charge of, you're in a new job or new position. Um, it could be applied um, more generally. And um, a little bit about me. So I've been at Princeton since 2000. You do the math. <laughs> um, currently manage a team of 16 content strategists, designers, developers, project managers. Started working with Drupal in 2010. I think I know something about Drupal. Um, and, and today I'm definitely eager to hear about your tigers. So if you're thinking about you've ever had a tiger land up on your doorstep, um, I'm going to try and leave time at the end for, um, to, to hear your stories. Um, and you know, uh, I also want to just say thank you to Michael Muzzy. He helped me put some of this presentation together and my team for their inputs. Um, and yeah, so that's about me. Um, I think you know, if you're going to leave here with anything, just you're going to leave here with the things to consider when inheriting a website. Um, some checklists, and I'm going to post them online. And then just a sharing of stories. And if you've got a really bad experience with a tiger, I'll see you at the after party. You know, commiserate. <laughs> um, so I think you know the thing that that really resonates with me about Drupal is that it is a very powerful content management system. And the more powerful it is, the more complex it is. And um, there's more than one way to accomplish something in Drupal. And that's what makes that, you know, you see, you see a tiger show up on your doorstep and you think you've seen a cat, but it could really be something different going on underneath. Um, you know, there's more than one way to create blocks and, you know, more than one way to do a view. And, um, and another uh, analogy I use is, you know, it's kind of like birds, like my team, we build a lot of parrots and owls, but occasionally we get like this flamingo in the door and we're like, oh, we're not really sure, does this one fly, does it like the cold? So, you know, these are like Drupal sites and, you know, some birds can fly, some like warm weather. And, and so um, my analogy is, and I you know, keep in touch with my peers, like my Princeton Drupal and underneath, it's basically the same, but it looks different than um, Yale's Drupal and Cornell's Drupal, but it is Drupal. And so this checklist hopefully helps you under understand like, where to start when trying to figure out like, what kind of Drupal it is that you've just walked into, which is especially important because if you weren't there from when it was built, you might not understand um, how it got to be the penguin or ostrich it is. So. Um, and I had to throw in the tiger because we are Princeton Tigers, so um, you can think of it like birds. Okay, so I sort of look at, the, uh, at a website from three lenses. One being like a business and product owner. Like what is the site supposed to do for my department or unit or business? The second is from like the content and design. You know, what's in, what goes into it? How does it look? How is it presented? And then the technical piece, which is like the code and security. Um, and those sorts of things. Um, so that's how um, you'll see that I've organized the checklists. And a couple words about checklists. So I love checklists. 
Um, uh, if, if there's a psychological piece to it, you know, if I think of something and it's in my mind, I can put it somewhere on a list and know, okay, let me get that off my mind, write it down. Um, it's not gonna take up space in my head. I can move on to something more creative. Um, and so I, I have lists. I have like post-its. Today I don't, but I have it stuck in my computer. I have lists. I have to-do lists. Um, so to me, if something's in my mind and it's a worry, I'll just write it down and then I can move on and get other more important stuff done. So I really like checklists. Um, the checklists that I'm gonna show you today, feel free to take them, fill them in, uh, share them with others, adapt for your needs. Um, a and then a couple other things about checklists. So there's, you know, as great as I think they are, a little word of warning. So you don't want a checklist that's just like this never ending thing. Because you, you can look at it and go, I'm not gonna do any of this because there's just a hundred things to do. Um, when you make a checklist, you do want to prioritize what's the most important thing to do first. And then ideally, if the checklist gets long, you want to group things just to make it more manageable. Uh, right now, I have a checklist um, just to do my, when I go into the office on Monday, it's about 16 items long. It's kind of long for me, and I just kind of look at it and glaze over. So it's good to group things in the checklist. And then um, another uh, word of advice is when you're uh, using a checklist, don't think, oh, you know, I've used this checklist a lot. I'm going to get cocky. I know what's on it. I don't need it again. Don't get too cocky. Uh, bring the checklist out and, and reuse it because um, it's easy uh, in the hustle of your workday to just forget something and, and be overly confident. So a couple, those are my words of warning about checklists. Um, okay. Other checklists you might have encountered, you know, you might have been on an, an onboarding, you might have seen an onboarding checklist, like into a hosting platform or onboarding a new staff member. Um, website launch checklist. My team has a website launch checklist, so every time we launch a site, we run through the checklist, and once in a while, someone's like, ah, we knew, but they forgot to look at one thing in the checklist. So we have an, a website launch checklist, and there are, there are obvious things on it. And that's okay if you put these just obvious things, like, oh, of course we're not going to forget to take it out of maintenance mode. Um, it's okay to have the obvious things on there. You might have seen you know, like a skill set readiness checklist. So if you're um, managing a team and you're wondering like what their maturity is to move into a different technology, that's a checklist. Security checklist, accessibility, troubleshooting checklist. Did you try turning it on and off? Hmm. Um, so other checklists. Um, you might have seen them though. You know, it's like um, um, not quite a checklist form, but just you know bullet points or guidelines. But still like listed, list some obvious things that you should do. Okay, so then the list. So what I'm gonna do is switch over to a PDF just so I can zoom in on them. But again, copy them, adapt them to your specific needs, and I will post them um, in my presentation, okay? Uh, I'll probably put them in as an Excel format. So, so, so again, I did them for three lenses, so the business and product owner, and I've also called out which ones are, the, what's the urgent thing you need to do? The first thing, pay your bills. You know, is there like a payment due on this thing that you now own? And maybe it's um, a hosting, um, maybe it's not something obvious, but you've got a connection to, let's say like a juicer, social media platform. Do you guys, have anyone use juicer? It's like a social, yes, okay, a couple of people. <laughs> Aggregator, well, there's a fee for that. And if you don't pay that fee, will content not appear on your site? Maybe. Or um, Google Maps. Does anyone pay for Google Maps? Yeah, okay. So um, pay your bills. There you go. Obvious, but, you know, you, you just pay your bills. Okay. Um, who has permission to log in, and should they still have permission to log in? I see this often, often missed, especially, yeah, I see a head nod, yeah. It's a good thing to just go through the list of people, even if it's long, just to make sure that they should still have permission to log in. Um, and then the word of warning that is if you do remove the person from your list of editors or whatever access or role they have, um, being careful not to delete their content when you do that. Um, I believe it, it's something it, to the effect of like, um, assign them to anonymous or make a con content belong to anonymous, something like that. 
I have seen someone remove people. They were trying to do good and clean up their site and delete a bunch of content. And then we'd have to scramble and put it back together. Byron's smiling. I think maybe you helped. Uh, Google Analytics, does this website have it? It's good to know if this website you now have inherited has Google Analytics because it can tell you some things about its performance. Who built the website? Um, do you still have a relationship or contract or something with the person who originally built it so that now you own it and if you have a question about, you know, why is this like this, um, you could go back and, and, and maybe ask them. I just wanted yeah. to um, remind, uh, so who owns the Google Analytics account? We've yes. gotten in situations with that. Good, good point. Yeah, I've got a couple comments in that. So who owns the account, right? Just because it has analytics. Does it, you need, still need to know who owns it and then have that. Um, make sure you can get into it. Make sure you can get into it. Yeah, thank you, Myron. Uh, documentation, does it exist? Right, where is it? Yeah, hopefully it does. It's not everyone's favorite topic, documentation. Um, yeah. Um, but it can give you some clues as to why the site was built the way it was built. So instead of you trying to figure out like what is this, where is this coming from, it can give you some clues if it was, if it was done well enough. Um, I've seen um, documentation stored. You know, so if so, where where is it? I've seen um, I've seen it stored in in a couple places. One, I've seen it actually just put into a Drupal page in the site. It's just it's not a published page, but it's just a Drupal page. So you might want to go to content and search for the word documentation. Maybe, maybe it's there if someone, if someone wrote it. Um, I've also seen it um, for, for our sites that we build from scratch. We will put a link to it in the admin toolbar. And it's just stored in Google Documents. Um, but the link to get to it is with the site. Um, from a business or product owner, what's the purpose of the website? You know, maybe you've come in and, and, or you're new and, or you just inherited the site. And you, do you even still need this site? What is this site supposed to do? What are, what is the goals of the website? Uh, again, this isn't like an urgent thing when you first get the site, but just kind of confirm like, why you have the site. Who is the target audience of the site? That sort of goes with the goals, and who's the closest competitor or peer? So business product goes. Anyone have any glaring things I've missed? Thoughts? All right, moving on from the content design lens. The list gets longer. Wait till you see the technical list. <laughs> Urgent. So I'd say the first thing when you get the site is just start clicking through the pages. Is anything obviously broken um, that's going to cause someone to not even be able to use the website? So do a click through. It's, it, you know, again, some of these things here are obvious, but just do the click through. Um, Change or update the contact emails. Are they still going to the old owner's address? So for example, I've seen a web form and the submit button goes to someone who lo no longer works here. <coughs> and you don't want to have that happen because now you've got information that someone's trying to tell you go into like, the abyss or some bounce back email. Okay, so make sure that the contact emails are still going to the old site owner's email address. You know, same thing with billing. Make sure the bills are going to the right place. Uh, is the content even accurate and up to date? So again, doing a read through, same thing with clicking through to see if something's broken. Actually read the website. A number of people I've seen just take the website and they don't take the time to read through every page. It can be um, a, a, a task that does it's not quick, depending on how many pages you have. Yeah, um, I just want to mention this might be on your uh, developer list. Um, not only where are the uh, emails going to, the site email, where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's a good, good point. Yeah, so it's coming from, and someone hits a reply to. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, would you get the bounce back if it goes to a bad address or if it's yeah. somebody else, someone else? Can... Yeah, good point. Um, and, and one way you could do that is, well, one, just simply searching the pages for contact us or the obvious things, contact, get help. Or simply going to your content, log into the site, go to the content list, search for web forms, filter by web forms, 
And then just start looking and how those were built and where the um, submit button's going or from is going. Look in the settings. Content accurate and up to date. Um, do you have an editorial calendar for the for the website? Did it come with one? Maybe, maybe not. And you know, the tip on this is within the content, is there some upcoming deadline posted on a page that is in the past? I see folks um, inherit a site and they don't take the time to read and they have um, upcoming upcoming things that are you know like a year old and I think it's a good uh, exercise to check that and edit that um, but the editorial calendar also will help you understand the cycle of your websites so another example would be um, there are units here at the university and every year they have an application cycle. And so during part of the year it says, you know, applications are closed, check back on X date for them to open. And then when the, the cycle does open up, they then um, publish the here is how you apply content. Okay, so like cyclical content um, for the website. Um, another thing along an editorial calendar is if your website has any um, cyclical like, traffic spikes. So here at the university, we clearly operate on an academic calendar. Students register, add job classes, start classes, they're on break, um, they get housing at certain times of the year. So knowing that with your website, when are these peak usage times, when it's like really got to operate, um, is helpful and that can all go into your editorial calendar. Is there a sitemap or content inventory? Um, when we inherit a site we'll run a tool that does an automated content inventory for us and while it might it, on a larger site give us thousands and thousands of results it will at least give us an idea of like what size site we have um, do we have hundreds of images or thousands of images? Do we have 10 PDFs or 100 PDFs? Um, do we have um, 100 pages, but hmm, in the menu it only looks like there's 10. What's really going on with the site? Um, so we will uh, run an automated content inventory. Um, that content inventory will give us um, URLs. And so from there, we'll even take an extra step of grouping the URLs, and so it also helps us understand well, how many content types do we have, or how many things are on each path, and it gives us some clues about what's going on with the site. We happen to use a tool called, um, what do we use? I'm blanking Screaming on the name. Frog. Thank you, Screaming Frog. Screaming Frog. So, yeah, Screaming Frog, yeah. And also, be aware, do you have any orphaned pages? Like, they're live on the site, you can find them in search, but they're not connected anywhere in your menu. Now, some people, that's their strategy of their site, but you just need to be aware that they are there and they are live, and people can find them. Okay. Does the website work, ooh, I have a typo. Does the website work on tablets or phones? Again, maybe it's an obvious one, but something to just um, give it a look. Is it accessible? So remember to include all abilities as website um, as visitors to your site. Um, you, there's there's been at least one accessibility session here. There's, I think there's one every year. But just be aware. What are your organization's accessibility requirements? Do the links work? Right, obvious one. Do they work? But not just work like they go somewhere, but they go to the right place. Um, I have not found a great tool that does it. There is um, the W3C link checker tool. I use that. It, it, it gives me like a 404 error report. Um, but it doesn't help when it comes to checking links if they're actually going to the correct website. So they might, you might have a link to another website. And on that other website, sure, the page works, it's not a 404 error, but the content has changed and that is not what you intended to take people to. So it's not only do the links work, but do they go to the proper place. Is there a process for content contributors to create new content, stage it, get it approved, revised? 
I don't know, maybe there is. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have a workflow on the website. So it's something to check. Um, editing interface. Can editors easily update the website? And does the um, user interface and design meet the business goals? And this is going back to your goals. So an example of this, and I've seen, you know, we, we'll talk with departments or units here, and they'll say, we are this like, exciting, cutting edge department, and their website looks like it's from like, 20 years ago. And so we say, well, you're saying one thing, but visually in the interface, you're showing something else. And uh, particularly if you have a lot of upcoming events and your webs and they're not on the site. So this is content and design. I did group them. They are, you know, they can be two separate things, but I, I put them in one list. Two most urgent things, of course, are like broken stuff and um, contacts. Okay. Technical. We get a little longer. Can you even log into the website? Yes, we have inherited sites, and the owner does not even know how to log in. And it's not just the site; um, it's the any anything you know, the server, um, anything else. Like Byron mentioned, the Google Analytics account. Can you even log in um, to it? And you'll want to as the owner of the site. Um, you should have access to the site as the highest privilege admin user, hopefully. Hopefully you can get that. Um, when does the SSL certificate expire? Yes. <laughs> this has happened. It's yeah. expired. Nobody knew. That's a great one. Put it on a calendar. Put it on some calendar. Just remind, remind yourself. Is Drupal updated to the latest version? Check. Um, I'm, I'm recommending become very familiar, and I hope everyone here, if not already is, after today, is very familiar with Drupal.org, um, and think about planning for the future at Drupal 6, Drupal 7, moving them to 8 to 9. Okay. So just, you should, you should know um, what version your site is, even if it's not the latest version, I'm going to do it in air quotes, the latest version, um, you should at least know what version it is, and that's simple to check for. Are the modules updated? Okay, I have this as an urgent thing because there could be some security issue, which ties into the second one, how are updates managed? Um, actually, I think I might know it normally. But someone, so security, someone needs to monitor the Drupal security updates, so drupal.org slash security. I believe on our, our websites that my team manages, we have, um, we get the Wednesday email, right? I'm looking at Byron, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we will um, be notified of which modules have security updates, and then we'll take action. But you may get a website in which the owner has not updated things in a while, and you're going to need to go in and assess. And then you also need to understand how are the updates managed. You may do it one way, but however they were managed, I, I don't know. They might have been managed, and they might not have been managed at all. Is there a custom domain name? If so, who's the domain registrar, and when does that expire? Another obvious one, but still something you should you should know. Where is the site hosted? Um, we have inherited sites, and the owner's like, well, I don't know. And now we've got to go digging and see, okay, well, who is the host? Where is it? How do we get access to it? So where is the site hosted? Um, and when it comes to the hosting, if you manage, if you also have inherited not just the Drupal site, but the hardware it's running on, uh, how is that managed? Um, and is it due for replacement or upgrades? And is your hardware sized correctly? Uh, how long ago and where was this website backed up? Was it even backed up? And noting that backups for Drupal sites involve three things, the code, the database, and the user uploaded files directory. 
Do you have a disaster recovery plan? Do you know how to restore the site from backup? If you don't, then it's, it's a, definitely a disaster. So um, plan for that. Is there a development environment? A staging and QA environment? Of course, this allows you to deploy the code to non-production environments for testing. So it kind of, I think it ties into the, um, to the how do you manage your updates? Do you just update right on production? Or do you update on QA, look, and then update on production? Is there HTTPS support? Oh, no, I skipped one. Is the, is the code version controlled? Does everyone here version control their code? Going forward, I hope you might get a site that is not version controlled, and you're like, you know, I don't even know, you don't even know what's going on with the site. So, um, you know, version control is a tool that helps you manage the source code over time. Git is, I think, the one that a lot of people have heard of. So, um, is there HTTPS support? So, my understanding of this is, you know, you don't. Um, well, first of all, the S is for security or secure. Be, that's how I think of it. And um, you don't want your website visitors to get that not secure little note in different browsers treated differently. Some will pop something up. Um, so be prepared for HTTPS. And the comments are really, the, all the traffic should be forced to HTTPS. Is there search coverage issues with your site? Um, and then the other, the note on this is you should have ownership of the domain in Google Search Console, ideally. Uh, it's good to do, um, test the site for search. And even understanding which search has been installed or applied to the website you're just, you've just inherited. Are there performance issues? You know, cl click through the site along with, you know, looking for things that are broken. Click through the site. Is it slow to load? Um, if so, you might have something going on that you need to take care of. And I'll just do slow. You know, you can define slow how you want it. Um, but uh, generally, you want it to be um, pretty speedy because if it's not, it could indicate some other problems with the site. And are there performance issues? Again, like with the slow to load. Um, do you have performance monitoring on the site? Is there? Have you? Is the tool been applied to um, to monitor the performance? We happen to use New Relic, and um, I think we've been pretty happy with that. And do you have a cache strategy? Kind of ties to performance. So cache strategy, um, you know, something like is it is are your parts of your site memcached? Um, Reduce load on your database servers. I, I might have seen at other Drupal conferences, other yeah, just entire presentations on the cache. Um, and I've even at one seen a T-shirt that says "Keep calm and clear of cache." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the technical list, and these are the three lists. Um, let me go back to my presentation because that's the meat of the presentation. Really, I'm going to upload these to. Um, the website. A um, couple of case studies. This is just really brief and I'm trying to just summarize it in one one slide. So here um, in the web development services team in the past 12 months we've inherited two websites which we didn't build. It might have been more but sometimes I block it from my mind. Uh, and we examined them from the technical lens. So we were taking them on in the technical role. Uh, and again you might not own the whole site as the business owner or the content uh, or designer. Um, you might just be responsible for the technical piece, and in these two cases we were. So first thing we did was we just clicked through the website as a visitor, like what is this, what is this tiger in a box that we have just inherited? Um, clicking through gives us the sense of like what's broken, performance, how big it is. We did run an automated inventory with Screaming Frog. Um, then what we did is um, we mapped the content types to our default um, 
content type. So we have a platform that we build all of our sites in. We have a couple platforms, two, three. Um, and we are looking to see how far this deviated from how we structure and build our sites. And that, uh, that gives us a sense of, is this like an owl-like you know, site, or did, is this like a flamingo? And we're really talking about two different birds here. Yeah, I've got like a bird cat thing going on. <laughs> and, um, and then ultimately we did decide to move these sites um, and migrate them into our um, default platform so that there's consistency. And we aim to do that with as many um, tigers as we inherit, and that's so a team um, of our size, 16, can actually support and manage like a thousand sites. Sorry, Byron, I keep looking at you, but it's, it's a lot of sites, and Tanya helps <laughs> us support, support them. Um, so we did end up migrating them. Um, not naming any names of the websites we inherited, <laughs> uh, some were built uh, better than others, and one had documentation, one did not, and um, that was our strategy moving forward with these sites. Okay. So what else? So this is now opening it up to, have any of you inherited a site or came into a new job or new role and they said, you, Ray, you're in charge of the site, go figure it out? And um, what, how did that go? What was that experience like? I mean, I, I, this is a great a list, and it, it, for me, it kind of provokes thinking about so many of other things that we go and we, we check, and we've had experiences where, you know, we've inherited sites where all the email and newsletter functionality was handled on the site. And when you're doing live development and testing, you don't want your site to send out email just automatically to folks. So if you know that would be a something that we might add to the checklist saying, is your site gonna randomly email people that you don't want it to necessarily contact and good one. You know, yeah. uh, but there it's it's good the idea of having the checklist are I think really great no matter how many times it's almost as if you have to have a checklist because you do it so many times mm -hmm. it, it, you know and if you only do it like every once in a while I think you're like more likely to check everything mm -hmm. because you only do it every once in a while when you get do it so often the checklists are essential because it's like well I know I checked it on that site but did I check it on this site yeah. and so it's almost as if like all well, the checklists have to have a name on top for the site that you're checking and yeah so yeah. I, it's great yeah, yeah. It, so that experience of the site sent out we had that experience here we it was another site we didn't develop no idea and then suddenly you get a call from a vp i what's just got a hundred emails yeah. what's going on yeah. yeah and you're like no idea where it came from you're like well it must have come from our site because we just made a change yeah yeah good good thing to add yeah yeah um, and uh, in fact, in our launch checklist, since we launched so many sites, we actually do have one for each website. Um, and then actually taking it further with the columns, it has a who owns it and was it done? Like a yes, no. Yeah. yeah it's really great. Right. Yeah. Just question. kind of follow up on that. About six or seven years ago, I, I had built a site, handed it off mm. to the client who, who took it. And now, six or seven years later, I'm still getting uh, Drupal emails saying, uh, update your modules. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea who to contact, but they're in a little bit of trouble. Uh, <laughs> they haven't updated their site in six or seven years. It's a Drupal 6 site, too. Um, but also, I, I want to emphasize something you, you said, Joel, about ownership, account ownership, especially on the domain. I've been involved in situations where um, I inherited a site and I had a client, and the client um, had this other third party who, who had owned the domain for the site, right? Mm -hmm. and, and probably had said, okay, you build the site, uh, yeah, go register the domain for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a problem, especially when you need to change DNS, especially if you're now moving to your own server, which, you know, which, which I think you guys then moved to your own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and that person is like a little upset that they lost the gig. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not changing, yes. <laughs> they're yeah. not changing, they're helping you change the DNS or anything like that's, that. That's it, absolutely it's true. It's a really frustrating experience. Yeah, we certainly had that happen here as well, where the, um, we knew we were going to take over the site, and the uh, product owner and the website owner said, look, you know, we have this person that meant, we don't want to let them know yet that this is going on, because now they're going to lose our monthly fee. And so we did have to handle that, that delicately. 
Um, another scenario is um, we'll usually the sites we do are Princeton.edu. Occasionally, the owner will want a something.org. They have no idea who set up the .org and how that all works. So now we're in the let's go trace down who's who and someone who worked here three years ago and trying to get uh, a hold of that. Yeah, it happens. One recommendation we'll make when someone's starting a brand new site is to not tie some of these things to an individual's email, but to actually, so we call them here service accounts. It's tied to like, so if my department is WDS, we have a, a WDS at Princeton.edu type email. And so you don't need to worry about the who and changing it from, from Jill to Byron to Christian. It just goes to the, the general group email. We don't get every, you know, but there is the account where you can go and you can see them. Yeah. Same thing with the Google Analytics account. We see it all the time. People are setting it up under their own personal Google. Anything else? You know, and it occurs to me on the ownership issue, there have been a couple of times where I know we've had it relate directly to a, a host, and you actually can get your domain back, you know, if the administrative operator is not playing nice, and that you've got to send them letterhead and send them, I don't know, cancel checks and pictures of your firstborn. You've got to go through some, you know, hoops to do it, but you can do it. I mean, the system is made to, to, to accommodate that because these situations do arise, but I would imagine that's something else you can build into a checklist system, you know, that when something like that you know, you're unsure of, you can automatically start to escalate mm -hmm. and then if you were, like collect that material, that evidence mm -hmm. that you are, are the rightful owner yeah. of it. Yeah, even just like that note right there is like if, if you can't find the owner of this thing, here are some steps you would take to do it, yeah. you know, putting that on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other just general questions for me? This is my email. Do you have you found that because um, I, I know that the university did a uh, you know moved off of Roxon mm -hmm. and and so were were there particular issues that you were like oh yeah it was a Roxon site we we have that set of problems that we have to resolve is the does your checklist help you address those because if someone migrate if you're inheriting something that was a WordPress site or was a yeah. Roxon site yeah. or even a Drupal mm -hmm. six site are there ways to handle you know those particular snowflakes um, I think a lot of it is, is um, in this existing list because it is some general like who built it originally if yeah. we have a question about why was this configured this way and can we do it another way um, the contact owners for sure Google Analytics came up all the time people wanted analytics they wanted the history of analytics it was very heartbreaking to tell them like we don't even know, we can't even get them for you because whoever set it up initially is gone. Right, so those questions are kind of universally applicable. Kind of universal, yeah. Re re yeah. Regardless yeah. of what you're inheriting. Yeah. yeah. And you're making me think of one other, and that was um, does your website connect to other systems, other integrations? Right. You need to be aware of those. Yeah, yeah. And, and who how, owns the keys to those? Who owns the keys to those, yeah. Particularly if you're gonna take your website and you're gonna move it to another hosting platform, can that connection still happen, or integration still happen yeah, really from point. somewhere else? Thank you. Yeah. You know, one of the uh, other kind of cases that we've seen in, in, uh, in situations like this when we inherit the site is um, they usually come with a set of the backlog of like immediate things that need to be fixed. Mm. Uh, oh, great like one. The, the, uh, the uh, pain points. Mm -hmm. And so basically what it does to you, they're like, okay, you, uh, you need to onboard really quickly because there's, there's 10 things we want to get fixed in the next month or so. Uh -huh. uh, so and while you're working through the list, prioritizing it and understanding, mm -hmm. okay, how do I fix this without breaking the whole thing? Because you, you, you know nothing about how it was built. Mm -hmm. So you do things like code audit to understand those dependencies and integrations. Mm -hmm. But then eventually you get to a point, okay, I, I have a fix, so how do I release it now to production? And then mm -hmm. you realize that the site might not have like continuous integration release mm -hmm. procedures if there's nobody around to ask about it. Yeah. So um, like in our um, in our world like understanding the release process mm -hmm. and, and like pushing through the environments would be one of the things in the checklist. 
because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like eventually you were you were taking the side that you'll need to evolve further, mm -hmm. um, and pretty soon you'll need to be able to push the code. Through. Yeah. So. Those yeah. Are great. Great point. Yeah. One is there a backlog of issues that people yeah. need? Yeah. What's yeah. the urgency of them, and is there like a continuous integration? Yes. What's the process? Right. Yeah. yeah. Great points. Yeah. I'm curious if you if you if you if you do any training around it or if you think it would be helpful. Like it's almost as if that would be a great list to share with people three months before they're ready to you know, hand you their site, mm -hmm. like so that they can begin to get like it almost to do a training with with them. Yeah. You know, because I would imagine a lot of times it's not a surprise; it's anticipated mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stuff. And as right. do you do that? Is that something that that folks are, would find helpful, or, or are they receptive to it, or are they just too much, too crazed to? Usually too crazed. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. either you know, some my my main technical support has left, and uh oh, what do I do right. with this? That's why they're my, yeah, shifting they're, it to you anyway. Yeah. To begin exactly. With. Um, they're they just don't know what to ask. They mm -hmm. don't know where to find the answers. Um, that's sort of the main things, but I wish that they would do it ahead of time. And even any further that, how many websites do you have? Yeah. Uh, we've and 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 is there like a little microsite built within this site that you're handing us? That we're like, wait, you're really handing us two sites when you think it's one, and they just right. don't understand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fun, fun stuff. So. Yeah. Well, I misinterpreted the purpose of the course because I assumed I'm inheriting a Drupal site as opposed to one that was hand coded or WordPress or something else. I was looking what was going to be different. Well, even a Drupal site, you can get stuff that you're like, wait, why did they do it this way? Why is why is there a view that is yeah. rendering the node? That was a good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't yeah. understand that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. These things can apply, yeah. even if it is, even if it's still Drupal. Drupal, like she said, many ways to do stuff, and people have their own ideas of what's the best way, um, or when the site was developed, what was the best way then, as opposed to when you're inheriting it. Yeah, yeah. So Drupal looks like Drupal, but then you dig in a little further, and you're like, okay, how did they configure and click and put Drupal together to do what it's doing? Right. Yeah. Are they laying it out with blocks? Are they laying it out with context? Are they laying it out with so many? Yeah. 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 And usually, again, the, those kind of things you discover once you start looking into the backlog of issues. They say, okay, this. Uh, location map uh, is not working really nice. Can you fix it? And then you go in and like, oh, I understand why it's not working really well. Why did you do it this way? Yeah, yeah. And then you discover other dependencies. Mm -hmm. Getting access earlier, uh, like as early as possible, can help with those surprises. Yeah. Yeah. Because you might look at something and expect, oh yeah, okay, I bet I, I, I know what we can do to update that. And then, oh wait, they did it how? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so I inherited a site um, that it seems that for seven years they never deleted anything, they just unpublished it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I, you know, vanity URLs, unpublished pages, thousands mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. and then I'm a little overwhelmed <laughs> yeah, yeah. at the idea of going through all of those things. Is there any tips or...? So sometimes I, I'm like bold enough to tell the product owner like, if it's not published and you don't know, like just get rid of it. That's like then you really don't need it. And if, if people have this fear, like I don't throw anything out, I, I I throw like everything out. That's my nature. But if there's those like savers, you could tell them, well, look, one, you know, you can download the site. We'll keep it, you know, keep some copies somewhere and back it up somewhere. Um, or two, if they they still aren't easy about that, we'll tell folks, you know, look, there's um, something called archiveit.org. You might hear like, the Wayback Machine. You can go and look at an old version of your site, um, but I, I I throw stuff out. Like I, I do, yeah. You know about views bulk operations, right? <laughs> use bulk operations and admin views, so that way you can, um, like on the main content page, show me all the unpublished pages. Hit one checkbox. Um, and if there's more than one page worth, it'll say, do you want to select all 500 nodes? You say yes, and then you go to a drop down and delete, and bye bye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes me yeah, so like, happy to delete. Like, yeah. like you said, the command is doing the backup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
and also, like, as you do that, you can also sort by the um, by the date, and you could see that something wasn't published like two days ago. Maybe mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that may still be in the in the search somewhere. So maybe you want to do something, but I mean, it, it might be still indexed. Um, and another thing is that you could check through the analytics if you have access, just to make sure that you're not deleting any like high traffic pages. Mm -hmm. okay. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because everything out of that should be unpublished, not visited. Yeah, can go away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good question. I think we have oh, one more. I, just, um, I work for a government organization or agency, mm -hmm. and um, our site is one single site, but broken up into two site areas, five site areas. So I don't understand the whole multiple site type thing, but I kind of relate to how it's broken up that way. But the way I picture like, your checklist, I would just hit up my senior director and I was like, why aren't we using these? Because anytime someone wants to add either, not a new site area, but like a sub-site of their site area, I need to know who, because I have 12,000 mm -hmm. employees, I have six staff, we're the only ones that update content. Wow. So we have one voice and only one publication route, and it's my, my team, so this would help Who's supposed to be in charge of this? Mm -hmm. Who did this? Why did we do this? Who was the developer? So when, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I kind of thank you. It's yeah, really good. good to put on that. So. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, that content editing uh, line item in there. Sometimes you can take it a further. Actually, assign pages to people. Right. Yeah. We are. We are time. time. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. But it's just thank a you. Coffee break, so you know. <laughs> <laughs>